so um, my name is Louis Dunleavy. I work at Cutting Edge in, uh, in Australia, and I'm in the uh, Brisbane uh, branch. There's a, a Brisbane branch and a, and a Sydney branch. And I'm just going to take you through a bunch of projects that we've done using Houdini uh, as like our primary rigging and animation tool. Um, and so that goes through a bunch of different contexts. Um, so starting off with match move, with uh, body tracking, where we've been using the, um, the uh, older auto rig uh, that shipped with Houdini 15.5 and previous versions. So a bunch of these present, a bunch of these uh, screen captures of networks and things are in 15.5. Uh, uh, so myself, I've been uh, I've been working uh, with Houdini since before Houdini, since Prism, since 1995 when I started in Italy in a company called Digitalia. Uh, so obviously, uh, we all know what Houdini is today, and how side effects have just been so amazing in like all their support, and their their developers are so open and so helpful. Um, so it's really been quite a ride, and of course we all use Houdini in a, an effects context, doing lots of simulation work and uh, other things like that, so we're all very familiar with that kind of work. Um, but of course, you know, a lot of us have been doing animation stuff in Houdini since, uh, since the beginning, uh, and it's, it's, it's a really excellent uh, animation package. Uh, although it gets, you know, less kind of attention because of all the other strengths in the simulation stuff. So anyway, here's uh, some stuff we've been doing. Um, so this is our, our core team. Uh, Cutting Edge is, is a fairly large company, you know, a couple of hundred people. Um, and then there's lots of people in different disciplines and different departments and people come in and out of Houdini, depending on, you know, what's going on and their skills and, and things like that. Uh, so this is our, our core team, uh, really our, our ninjas, you know. So myself, uh, my old friend, Rangi Sutton, uh, Rob Kelly, Matt Crump, uh, Chelsea Shannon, Sean Jacobs, and Zanti Alvaro. So they're our go-to guys for anything kind of really uh, difficult, you know. So I'm going to start off. So we've we've got five different projects I'm going to have a look at. Uh, we've got vamp and you know kinds of categories of creatures, if you like. We've got vampires, uh, spiders, kangaroos, uh, storks, and then a robot dog. And we're actually doing a shark at the moment. Um, but uh, I don't uh, have that to show to you. Uh, so a lot of Australian creatures there. Should be a bit of fun. Um, so the first one is Underworld 5. So this project was done all in Houdini 15.5. And uh, this is like a vampires, vampire disintegration, uh, principally. And then there was some other character effects there where we're doing effects on top of uh, actors. And of course, experience has told us doing various like uh, character disintegration and things like that that um, the match move typically takes longer than the than the effects. You know, you'll, you'll you'll get the effects up and running relatively quickly. You know, your rigid bodies and your cloth and your fluid sims and particles and all the rest of it. Um, you know, you can work that out and get that really highly choreographable and and really. Um, artistically easy to, to manipulate. But then the, the body track typically takes so much refinement um, and you need to be able to adjust it dynamically, like as and when you need it, so that the effect is going to be effective in the right area at the right time and you're free to change that. So uh, we decided to, to do the body tracking in, in Tarlian Houdini, using, uh, starting off with the auto rig that used to ship with Houdini, the old auto rig, and then we built a load of things on top of the auto rig. So we'd put lots of extra stretchy limbs and detachable limbs. We'd be able to constrain controllers into screen space. So we'd do a lot of things like uh, getting unsolved 2D track points, you know, because with skin and cloth and stuff like that, it's very difficult to get. Uh, you know, solved 3D tracking points. So we'd get uh, 2D stuff and sort of project it down the camera, do depth matching, and then sort of solve things in screen space. So we do that with rig controllers, then we do that subsequently on the, on the mesh uh, and sort of constrain everything in screen space. And then we do things like get rotor splines and project them down and then make SDFs and sort of nudge the uh, contours, the profiles, um, as they're presented on the screen um, to the edges of the rotor spline. So a uh, typical kind of vampire uh, death. So this character is Jakob. Um, so you know, quite a lot going on there. Uh, rigid bodies and disintegration and, and obviously the timing 
is really a big factor of it, like when the, you know, when the leg is going to fall off, when his, when his head is going to fall off and all these kind of things. So we really need to be able to uh, control that. And the easiest way to control that in a Houdini effects context is by doing the, the match move in Houdini, you know. Um, so that's our first pass animation. Then on top of that, we do all those other things I was talking about. We do all the, the constraining and stuff like that. And you, you'd see we'd only really track the, the bits that we need as and when we need them. Um, is this another disintegration shot we're doing? Uh, so this is like our sort of first pass where we thought, oh, we're getting to a fairly decent point here. Uh, but then the uh, VFX supervisor uh, told us that actually there was supposed to be another three vampires in there. Uh, and they, they hadn't actually shot a plate for it. So that was a little bit tricky. Uh, so not to be outdone by Tom Cruise, uh, our valiant uh, artist took matters into their own hands. So we have uh, Rob Kelly and Sean here, Sean Jacobs, uh, taking things a little bit too seriously. So this is, this is then our first pass of, uh, of animation. Then we do all the cloth simulations uh, and all that stuff. And then these would become full DG doubles that then we run through our disintegration process. Um, so obviously that was pretty pretty handy. Um, so there was quite a lot of shots like this. Uh, again, you know, it was very very quick to get the uh, the effects running, but then the the match move would always be the problem. You know, you you would you really notice when your effects and and the uh, and the uh, actors are kind of out of sync when it's one is sliding on top of the other. Um, another one here, Gillian Davidson was the artist doing this one. Um, so yeah, more, more vampire disintegration. Uh, same thing again here, this was going through some feedback compositing in Houdini just to generate the texture maps. Um, and of course, again, if you uh, start to see the effect sliding over the skin, you know, it becomes really, really noticeable. So uh, this required like, you know, quite a lot of massaging. And again, it's very, very difficult to get anything to track on that surface. Whereas it's quite easy to find the areas that are, are sliding, uh, you know, in, in comp or, you know, as a manual 2D track and then just kind of push that whole uh, the thing of fixing the, the track into Houdini um, and manipulate the mesh that way. And here we have the, the mesh on top there. Cool, so that's vampires. Uh, the next one is Ness. So this is a, a spider film. Um, so this is a, an Australian Chinese co-production. And this is all about the funnel web spider, um, which is mainly found around Sydney. And this was quite a, a big show in that we had a couple of hundred shots of spiders uh, in various different scenarios. So we had uh, spiders crawling on people, uh, single hero close-up shots of spiders, swarms of like 50,000 spiders, uh, and spiders in all kinds of different flavors and stuff. And a small team uh, with, you know, varying diff different levels of exposure to Houdini and skill sets and things like that, um, and pretty fast turnaround. Is this the funnel web spider? They have uh, quite a bit of variation, uh, but, so we, we started putting, putting them together, you know, what, what do these guys look like? What do they move like? Um, you can see, so this was like our first kind of uh, spider uh, bit of test there. Uh, so you can see they've got eight legs and then they have these pedipalps, sort of feelers on the, on the top there. So actually that turns into like 10 legs because you can see they're walking with pedipalps. So this is uh, Chelsea Shannon did this uh, animation, this is our first bit of walking animation. Uh, so, you know, we, we really liked the way the animation was going, but we quickly realized we were going to be in trouble animating like literally hundreds of shots or, well, a couple of hundred shots uh, with lots and lots of spiders. So the average shot had maybe a dozen spiders or something. Um, so the early test taught us that animating eight legs and two pedipalps is very time consuming. Uh, spider locomotion, so just getting from A to B, is very time consuming. Um, we wanted to keep everything in Houdini because obviously uh, for all the various reasons of having to deal with uh, swapping between software just for you know, different sections of the pipeline, 
Um, it was much faster and more efficient to just run everything through Houdini. Um, and we wanted to keep compartmentalization minimal. So, you know, we wanted people to have the freedom to just animate if that's what they wanted to do, or animate and light, or, you know, depending on their, their skill levels, um, we'd be able to uh, make sure the artists weren't getting frustrated and could get more satisfaction out of the job. Um, so typical uh, hero shot. So we, we for the for the hero spiders, uh, we have two types of animation. Really, we have sort of your standard kind of animation, just moving the rig around, and then we have a curve rig animation. So that's basically where we just draw a curve over the the terrain that we're interested in, and the spider just walks itself, and then the animator just kind of animates on top of that, and blends in and out of where they want you know um, the walk to be to be automatic or uh, hand hand keyed. So. More typical shots with spiders. <coughs> Quite a few scenarios. Another very early shot that, that Chelsea did. Um, so really lots of situations with spiders all over each other. Um, and different types of spiders. You know, we have a, a very large queen spider down there. So we had to have a lot of variation in proportion and um, styles of, of spiders, you know. So for the spider rig itself, uh, so obviously we're going to look at a bunch of different rigs and, and sort of how they, how they uh, were built and how they work and uh, you know, the pros and cons of various different approaches. Um, so the spider rig itself obviously had to be very easy and fast for hero animation. You know, um, a lot of animators will come from, uh, from Maya and other packages and um, you know, uh, initially there's always a bit of a steep uh, learning curve initially. Um, but then typically animators get going like really, really, really fast. Um, and the main reason for that is because we're able to uh, update the rigs really, really quickly and uh, so address any issues we have. So it had to be very easy for hero animation. I had to walk in a curve, so that had to be very easy and fast. Um, and we had to transition, you know, be able to transition between the hero animation to curve animation and back again uh, seamlessly without any issues. Uh, I'd, Animation on top of the curve rig animation, so have automatic animation plus uh, hero animation, and th that not those things not to be fighting each other. And then a lot of secondary animation, like a, a um, sort of terrain adaptation, you know, sort of uh, not uh, going through the terrain, so the contact points would always be good, and then sort of secondary things like bobbing around and flexing of the limbs and all these things. So here's uh, one of our animation rigs. Uh, so obviously we'd we'd version up with the namespace thing, so we we could have multiple versions of the of the rig uh, in any given scene, which is great. So an animator could do like uh, an animation in rig version seven, and then a month later come back and throw in a rig version twelve uh, in the same scene and uh, keep going. Um, so one thing I, I just wanted to touch on uh, in a few cases here is uh, just the, the whole debate between uh, flat rigs and nested rigs in Houdini. So obviously uh, with agents in the crowd system, uh, that's all built for like uh, flat FBX style uh, rigs, which, uh, which is great. And the new auto rig system uh, essentially builds a flat rig. But of course we find that the, you know, the first thing anybody really does once they've got their basic rig worked out, is they acetize it, you know. So it's just so much easier to control. But of course, we, you know, it's a balance. You have to kind of know when you're going to acetize um, and why. Uh, so here we have the the old rig on the on the left, which was a flat rig, and we needed to keep it flat because we were we knew we were going to generate lots of agents for the crowd system. Uh, and then on the right, we have the uh, nested rig. So. If we have a look at the, the flat one, so we can see um, quite a lot of nodes there. <coughs> We've got quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of legs that are repeated, so we have the same uh, thing over and over again. Um, so that so, so that that was fine. Uh, basically, for the agent generation, we would have a simplified version of of this. We would have this driving a simpler rig, um, but then this quickly became a bit unwieldy. So the limitations are obvious, I think, with that kind of thing. Uh, if you've got eight legs and two petty palps, you know, you're just going to, some, at some stage, you're going to have problems. 
uh, errors that creep in. Any updates can only be done one at a time per chain, and then only one person can edit the reg at a time. <clears throat> and for me, that's a big one, because I think one of the most satisfying things about rigging in Houdini is rigging as a team, you know? Uh, so Rob Kelly, for example, he's very, very strong rigger. So, you know, we would uh, divide up uh, the rigging uh, between us and also Chelsea, very, very good rigger. Um, so it might be, I, I'd say, oh, I've got the, uh, you know, I've got this part of the rig and Rob would go, I've got this part of the rig. So someone could do a leg, someone could do a spine, someone could do a head, and you could all just be working at the same time. And you know you're all gonna just talk into each other's work and that's no problem. So that's a really nice thing about rigging uh, in that way, that it's very collaborative. So uh, the nested rig, where we've got um, assets for every part of the rig. Uh, so obviously, we've got eight instances of the leg asset. Uh, we can all work in it at the same time, less human error, because obviously, things propagate out automatically. And any features that you add to one element of the rig just goes on all the different limbs. So that's our, our leg asset for the spider. And um, you'll see that we've got, some, uh, we've got some bones there. So basically, a bit like the old auto rig system, uh, we, would, uh, we would sort of take a snapshot of the bind pose of the, uh, of the exterior bone chain. So we have a very simple bone chain, and that tells us uh, what the initialization of, of the leg rig asset has to be. So we'd sort of propagate that, that through as uh, top level parameters into the, into the leg rig. So we just dive inside and have a look. Um, and as you'd expect, it's a, you know, a nice contained rig with all the bits, much easier to work out uh, problems on, much easier to develop and, and roll out uh, updates and tricks, like for the um, foot sliding and terrain adaptation and flexing and all these things. And then it's just much easier to look at. It's much easier to navigate. Um, and so we can move forward in an easier way. And it's a typical Houdini way to work. Um, but of course, nested rigs does pose some challenges. Um, so obviously, mirroring the legs uh, is, you know, requires more expressions all over the place where you're going, if it's a left leg, if it's a right leg, and this, that, and the other. Um, then you've got to do that thing of propagating the bind pose from your sort of template bones outside. Uh, and then if you're uh, editing the capture data, um, that can be a little bit tricky. Uh, so a lot of string munging of capture data can uh, crop in. Usually uh, with the Houdini rig, it's enough to kind of go, you know, reset bind pose, um, and there you go. But then when you've got a sort of a modular rig uh, system, that, that um, can be a little bit uh, more overhead, basically just a bit more work, really. Um, so the other things that we had in the spider rig uh, was obviously flexing, uh, the terrain adaptation, um, blends, FKIK blends, the proportional changes uh, and scales and all this kind of thing. So uh, all fairly standard stuff for, for a rig. So here we've got just some of the uh, um, interpenetration solves. So we just uh, run some intersection things and push that back up to the, the top level of the rig. Um, so we could do that stuff. And then we've got flexing, so the, the spiders can flex their legs um, and other secondary animation like that. Uh, and then we've got the curve rig. So uh, basically the curve rig would have to go on either a uh, deforming person or whatever, whatever it was walking on uh, or um, static uh, geometry. So we'd typically just turn things into VDBs and remesh them. You draw the curve in it, put the spider on the curve, um, and then you've just got some simple parameters to do the locomotion, and then you can just tweak things on top. So uh, typical scenario there, a simple curve drawn on a uh, simple terrain. And then we drop down a uh, curve rig and just wire that in. Uh, and our spider is just going to start walking on that really rather easily. Uh, as we can see there, we just turn that on. And uh, very often that would get, you know, we'd, we'd block out most shots really, really quickly like that. So, uh, so yeah, if we had, you know, a dozen spiders or something in there, that was pretty, pretty easy and straightforward. And uh, then you can noodle away to your heart's content, um, clean things up a little bit. 
and it's all quite uh, very fast. Um, so more spiders, obviously we'd, uh, we'd just be able to change the rate of travel along the, along the curve, uh, just throw in a few keyframes and make sure those spiders aren't uh, getting too close to each other. Um, so this obviously all for hero animation, not for agent animation where we have the uh, automatic uh, avoidance. Uh, so here's that, uh, uh, that shot we saw of the spider jumping out of the mouth. And again, that's uh, just a combination of uh, curve rig animation uh, where we've mapped out the footprints along the curve uh, across the terrain and then some here animation. And then obviously we could go in and just edit the position of the footprints so that uh, the spider could move around. So you just see we're going to dive into that, uh, into the asset now and just uh, move the footprints around. There we go, simple, simple geometry editing, and we just shift that foot around. And then of course each each foot you know has blend controls for like you know blend onto the curve rig, you know, automatic animation, uh, blend off, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, then of course the spiders have to uh, be able to just completely go off the curve rig, do hero animation, and then go back on it. So uh, just to make that easy, obviously, we, we'd throw uh, lots of helper uh, code in to just do fast automatic uh, keyframe generation. Uh, so there you go, uh, spider walks along. All we can see those red circles are basically sort of a randomized uh, flexing uh, so that the, the secondary animation, the flexing, would just uh, be slightly random as it walks along the curve. We've set a keyframe for when we want it to launch. So at a certain point, we go, OK, that's enough of the curve rig. Just set all the, all the blends um, so that we're free to move it around afterwards. And uh, then we're free to just do whatever the animator needs to do. Uh, very often, of course, with these spiders, they, they jump. Um, so to do a little jump there. And then we'd set another keyframe to just put it up, put, set all the blends back onto the, onto the curve rig. And I just jump back straight on the curve rig. Um, so yeah, there we go. So automated animation and then back up. And of course we've got, we've got lots of other controls we can change. We can dynamically change the spacing of the, of the, uh, the strides of the, the lengths of, between the, the footprints. We can change all the spacing of the, the legs. Um, all the flexing, you know, we can, all those things that are, that typically you would modulate per point uh, in a Houdini setup, uh, we can just propagate that from the curve rig back into the, uh, back into the full uh, hero rig. So the curve rig is driving the hero rig, basically. Uh, so we can change all the interpolation types, we can change how long uh, the spider keeps his foot on the ground, like the type of acceleration out, whether he's kind of tiptoeing. Uh, just doing like just barely touching the ground or whether he's uh, sort of more planted and all these kind of things so uh, stuff that in a in a Houdini setup I think you know we, we all take for granted that we do all this kind of uh, elaborate uh, per point geometry editing um, and of course once you've got a rig that's listening to all that stuff that becomes quite easy to uh, um, to, to modulate for more interesting animation and then swarms, of course. So uh, this was, so the um, the Houdini crowd system was fairly uh, fairly new at the time, uh, and it was certainly there was no quadrupeds or anything like that. There was only some bipeds, um, and it hadn't really been tested in anger that much in production. Uh, and of course, we had to do spiders with like ten legs and uh, um, and and like lots and lots and lots of them doing lots of silly things. So, uh, so here we've got you know a typical kind of swarm shot. So we'd uh, have a few layers of spiders just to get that that nice depth. So we'd we'd uh, do say three layers, and then we'd constantly build up uh, meshed VDBs uh, of the of the surface that they walk on. <coughs> but of course, we we also need to deal with um, changing topology, uh, velocity inheritance, uh, ragdoll. 
um, the agents getting pushed around, and I suppose all the stuff that we kind of take for granted with the crowd system uh, these days. But uh, certainly for a spider, um, it was quite difficult. So, and of course, Cameron at Side Effects was uh, so uh, so helpful um, with any queries we had. And uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, you know, Side Effects are, are just so fantastic at supporting people in production, uh, especially if you're doing something that no one else has really done before. Um, so here you can see we've got some uh, spiders that are kind of uh, rag doing ragdoll uh, animation. So they're kind of getting pushed off and they die and they turn into a tasty snack. Um, so they all just kind of build up. And again, of course, uh, the body tracking was so important on this. Uh, and again, so we do all the match move uh, with uh, Houdini rig and do all that sort of um, screen space uh, constraint stuff that we were talking about earlier. Um, yeah, so let's just have a little look at some of those crowd uh, things. So obviously, we'd have to set up all the uh, um, all the collision uh, pills uh, for the bullet engine, because it's a bullet. Um, we'd get our curve rig and bake out some agents uh, doing with some uh, animation variation. Uh, and then we'd just test our rag dolls, make sure that's all working okay. Um, which is good fun when we finally got to this point. Um, and then we want to do our velocity inheritance. Um, and obviously the topology is constantly changing um, and so, you know, all these things need to sort of work together to be able to get to a, a good end result. Um, yeah, so that's it for, for spiders. So that was a bit of fun. And we have uh, Matt Hanger here, actually, who worked on this project as well. So um, lots of great work there, Matt. So at last, uh, so this is all about kangaroos, which in Australia they say roos because they just love to abbreviate everything. Um, and uh, so here we have a kangaroo, and uh, Matt Crump uh, was is the lead on this, and we're this is still actually in progress. Um, so I can't show you the uh, backplates of uh, of all the shots. So here we have our uh, one of our CG kangaroos, and we did lots of uh, crowds here as well. So. Uh, Here's some of our crowd shots. We've got four of these to, to have a look at. Um, so this is a comedy film. So uh, the, some of their movements are kind of delib deliberately kind of uh, comical, you know? Uh, I can't really give away too much about the film, but uh, there's certainly lots of fun. And of course, we'd put skin dynamics and fur dynamics on all of these guys, uh, which is obviously pretty easy to do in Houdini. Uh, more crowds. Great fun. And here we go. And so, of course, for this, we used uh, some of the new features. You know, obviously, we're foot planting, we're foot locking, and all that. And, uh, and we're using the new banking thing with the, uh, with the agents. So here we've got the, uh, the foot locking channels. And of course, the great thing about that with the agents is that, you know, if there's any kind of important bit of channel data that's important to you. So if it's like a soldier shooting a gun or, or some other event, um, it's quite easy to just shove those channels into the, into the clip and, uh, and pull it out later, either during the sim if you want to modify the sim, or as a later event if you need something to happen uh, based on some clip. And uh, in this case, that's just the foot locking. So we, we just make sure that the, the kangaroos have their feet uh, firmly planted on the ground. Um, and here we have our, so this is our banking uh, clips. So, um, yep, so they, they would just go into the, into the solver. So the, they would automatically lean over when they're, when they're turning into, into a, when they're turning a corner. And of course, you know, these guys, like with the spiders, uh, you know, every single character, every single agent is doing something completely different because there's the terrain adaptation, there's all the clip blending which is happening all at the same time. And, uh, and it's typically faster than real time to, uh, to run. Um, and it's very, very flexible because ultimately it's a particle system uh, calling all the, uh, the, the clip data 
that you've baked into the agent definition on disk. Um, so that's our simulation network. Um, so very easy uh, network to manipulate and very easy to get this uh, this thing running. But um, it's just it's just great to know, you know, like you, you can basically throw this at any any terrain. It's and it's it's just going to adapt uh, automatically. You can put in all those behavior changes, like if you get too close to this, then do that, and it's it's a it really is a fully fledged uh, crowd system. It's it's great fun. Uh, and of course, lots of secondary uh, effects related to the kangaroos. So they would kick up uh, some leaves and things like that. And then we would obviously do some fur dynamics with the, uh, the, the current fur system and give us some nice, uh, nice hairy kangaroos. And then we do some interaction with uh, some vegetation, so various uh, shots where that comes into play, where we do more typical Houdini simulation work. Okay, uh, so so this uh, this I ride. So this is uh, actually some birds, um, and this is for a very large uh, uh, hemispherical projection, um, and it was at like it was, so it was a couple of thousand frames of animation uh, of a flock of uh, black necked. Uh, storks um, on a sort of 4K uh, thing at 60 frames a second. So just for this, uh, we, we put in another camera at a slightly different angle just so we could sort of get a, a good look at the animation. Uh, so again, um, the birds all rigged up in Houdini. Um, and it was Andrew Kimberley was doing the animation here uh, and he was uh, actually off-site. So that's the other thing about uh, with Houdini, working remotely and uh, working cross-site is, uh, is really uh, fairly trivial as long as you've got a valid license and uh, you're up and running. Um, it's, it's very easy to have that back and forth. So that's uh, sort of a, a close-up detail of that animation at 60 frames a second, uh, slightly slowed down just so we can get a better look at what's going on there. Um, and we've got another couple of clips, just uh, one of our storks flying around. Uh, so this this just all the same animation, but just seen from a few different areas. And the, the deformation on the feathers is quite accentuated because it's, it was quite far away. Um, the bird rig itself, uh, so we've got a, the wing uh, rig in there. And um, obviously, you're quite free to uh, change things around and experiment. Um, There's just the guts of the feather system. Uh, so we do all the uh, the stacking, the interpenetration resolve, all the grooming. Uh, we're, we do the grooming with the fur tools, so we can have bent feathers, twisted feathers, uh, and then uh, so it's you know quite a big network. But I think there's some new stuff coming in Houdini that's going to make this uh, uh, an awful lot easier actually. Uh, and obviously we'd run cloth sims and wire sims on top of that. Um, so we've just got a few feathers there running through a cloth simulation. Um, so, you know, feathers are always a bit of a challenge, but, uh, but good fun. Okay, so uh, this is our last one. This is uh, Axel. So this is a film that's coming out, uh, coming out now. And it's a robot dog. And um, it's, uh, so yeah, it's like a kind of a teenage uh, film where it's sort of, Young teenage boy meets a uh, military grade hardware and you know forms a, an everlasting bond of friendship. Um, so this one the one of the shots. Uh, I'm quite quite fond of this one actually. Um, again, all rigged and animated in Houdini and obviously rendered in Houdini and stuff. Um, so it was quite a challenge. We were sort of uh, third in line uh, on the vendors to uh, to actually uh, do the uh, the work, so we're, we're waiting on the geometry for for quite some time. Um, so we had to move very very quickly to to get our, our rig together. Um, we did a few motion capture tests with a real dog. That was that was good fun. Um, basically, because we uh, as soon as we'd done a lot of things with agents, we wanted to try just round tripping it where we would uh, get get some motion capture, put it through the agent system. You know, get a bunch of clips, hand animation, and stuff put it through the agent system, and then um, push that back out onto a hero rig. But it, it turned out that at the end of the day, and we did test with motion uh, builder and everything, but at the end of the day, we sort of needed to just have very 
fine grained control on the animation because a lot of the shots that we were working on were um, sort of shots where the dog was like interacting with uh, actors on scene. So the animation was very, very specific. So even though it was, it was fun to experiment with that, um, it wasn't really going to get us very far at the end of the day. Um, this is just, you know, you, you might recognize the, 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 the bones there because uh, we, we just sort of started off with the new um, auto rig uh, in Houdini. This is before they had a, a quadruped rig. It's just a biped rig. And we, so we just threw that down because, you know, it's always good to just see what these things are, what's the current state of the auto rig. Um, so we started off there um, and then packaged it, package it up. And then, of course, we'd, we'd have a layered rig uh, system. So we'd have a primary an animation rig, which is the top one that you see there. And so our uh, animators would do all the first pass animation with that. And then we'd have a secondary uh, rig, which we're calling into form rig here, where we would resolve a lot of things like interpenetration between the plates and do secondary animation and jiggle and all those kind of things. Uh, whatever was needed, so we'd break we'd break those uh, those rigs up. Um, so we just have a look in the rig there. So again, uh, we've got our leg assets. Um, so each each leg has its own uh, little asset and all the various bits and bobs that it needs. And uh, again, Rob Kelly was doing some uh, great work in here. We sort of very collaborative. Uh, uh, process. So there's myself, uh, Rob, and Chelsea, and um, uh, and Rangi, and we all did a bit of rigging in there. It's great fun. So that was the front leg, and we've got the back leg. And you know we're, we're able to try a bunch of different things, like we're trying the uh, the new chop constraints um, for uh, some uh, targeting and uh, look at stuff and everything. Um, so this is just going to display some extra little bits and bobs that we needed to work out some of the uh, some of the motion between the different leg components there. So there you go. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to sort of briefly touch on is that uh, obviously being a robot and then being a, ha sort of having some very high density geometry, uh, we would uh, throw it around. The viewport with uh, just by setting the primitive intrinsics, much like you would do with uh, bullet uh, style geometry or you know pack primitives. Um, obviously, we, you know pack primitives in Houdini. Uh, there's so many different flavors. We've got fragments, we've got alembic, pack disc, and uh, uh, it seems like the, we're always ad adding new permutations to, to pack primitives. Uh, we found alembics were the fastest to throw around, um, so we just. Uh, define our uh, our axes for our three by three matrix in on the uh, the rest mesh. Oh, sorry, I'll just go back there. Um, <coughs> so yeah, we just uh, we we basically deform for a lot of these rigid elements. We'd deform a kind of a low res mesh with uh, some uh, local transforms defined there, and then using a simple point deform, we'd push the position around. And then with that bit of Xcode that we can see, pretty straightforward bit of Xcode, we just uh, edit the, uh, the intrinsics. And that was very, very fast uh, to update. So even though it's high-res geometry, very fast to throw around. So you can see that we've just edited the point positions. Um, and then we just apply the, the rotations. And uh, yeah, pretty fast. And then the same again for uh, some secondary animation. So we'd have just more localized controls where we would just edit those, uh, those vectors um, so we can just uh, throw some more rotations in as and when we need it. So, and that would allow us to give us, to, we, we could put some secondary jiggle on and um, some secondary rotations and things like that. And there we go. Um, and of course, that's the same animation that we saw before. That's just the, the render straight out of Mantra. And then we'll do some more effects on top of that. 
Can Rob Kelly was doing all the, uh, the uh, electricity effects here. Um, so great fun. That was, that was thoroughly enjoyable. And, uh, and here we've just got some of the other animations that, that we did uh, for that project. Um, so some of the animation is obviously robotic. That's kind of deliberate. And other times he's, he's just being very, very dog-like. Great, so there, there you have it. That's, uh, that's us. That's a good question. So, do we find do we find it hard to to get to recruit riggers? And yeah. well, um, I guess it, it's always the same kind of uh, uh, it's always the same debate. And really, that that works itself out on the floor pretty quickly because uh, some of the some of the fundamental concepts are very fast to to grasp. Um, usually, obviously, there'd be somebody senior, you know, like myself or Rangi Rob or you know one one of the one of the guys. You can just get someone up to speed very quickly. Um, I guess people's fears are usually uh, on the animator side, you know, so very often we, we, we'd have animators and they have uh, kind of a preconceived idea that, that, you know, animating in Houdini is kind of really difficult and all this kind of thing. And uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, we usually, uh, that, that usually disappears pretty quickly, to be honest, because we can update the rig so quickly and if there's any, you know, anything that's actually an issue, we can resolve it very, very quickly on the fly without interrupting the animator's workflow. Um, so we can do lots of testing under the hood and sometimes push out updates and the animator wouldn't even notice that things have been fixed. Um, so it is, yeah, on the rigging side, um, I mean, obviously there's a squeaky wheel phenomenon. You know, the more people that kind of do it and kind of say, hey, side effects, what about this thing? then the more that's going to get updated and the more people get familiar with it. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a fair uh, question to ask. Uh, and it's, and it's, it really is one of those things you have to evaluate, you know, based on your, your crew and, you know, who ultimately is kind of able to look at the, the system and go, oh, yeah, no problem, you know. Yeah. Uh how long does it take you to go from like um, the spider rig to like the final delivery, all the R and D and stuff, or like the, final, the spider project? How long would that take? Oh, like as in, what was the duration of the project? Yeah, or, yeah. Um, I guess the whole project went on for nearly a year, something like that. Uh, but it was a couple of hundred shots, so there's a lot of a lot of spiders. Um, I mean, obviously the the rig progressed. You know, we, we sort of went through like version 15 or 20 or something of the rig. Um, and the curve rig and all that kind of stuff. So you had like a few months to do R&D and, uh, you know, with all the shots coming in, you would know like how much stuff you would need and like... Yeah, like well, I guess we had, you know, obviously we'd, we'd have a few, a few shots to test on. And then, you know, we had to really also make an evaluation as to whether we could do it or not, you know, um, especially with the challenge of like just the numbers on it. And a, and a relatively small team and quite varied experience uh, with Houdini. Um, but, you know, the, the, that's the one thing about working, about a Houdini setup, it's that it scales very efficiently, you know. So you can very, very efficiently go from kind of quite labor intensive to so many things are fast and automatic. Um, so like a, a given shot, by the end of the project, you know, you could you could belt out a shot and you could belt out first pass animation on a shot for like half a dozen spiders in, in, a, in a day or two. And then, you know, you might go back and refine it, but you'd get your first renders out the first day. Um, so depending on, you know, yeah. the nature of the shot. And, uh, and for like the match move, uh, would 
uh, that it was done in, in Houdini, would that be done by Houdini artists or would that be done by match move artists or how do you guys? Uh, typically that? that was match move artists actually. Um, so that, that would be, you know, it's match moving, uh, there's various different levels of expertise and stuff like that. And, uh, and a lot of us can be quite um, labor intensive at times. Um, so that's, that's why we wanted to kind of put a lot of focus on trying to make that whole thing uh, easier and more flexible and just kind of give our match move artists sort of different tools to be able to tackle that thing because very often pushing a rig around, a traditional rig around with traditional controllers is just it's a very frustrating process. It'll only get you so far. But to be able to kind of go, well, you know, you just, if you can track that thing in, in 2D, if you can if you can make that thing follow in 2D, then we'll make it work for you in 3D. Um, so sometimes it just came down to that, you know. As well, with the match move stuff, uh, what was the motivation of not just going to an outsourced studio that has all those tools already in the pipe? Normally, yep. you get a perfect track in a day. Well, we've done that many times. So that that was not our first disintegrating yep. human project. Um, so certainly I've, I've done a lot of disintegrating humans in different studios, um, big studios, small studios. Um, the simple answer is it's never good enough. Okay. It's, it's never good enough. Like once you see, once you have some effect that's on skin or, or cloth or something and it's, and everything's moving, like every single aspect of it is, is moving, you, you, you really can't be constrained to something that's been done offsite and you just have no ultimate final control over. Whereas if you if you build all the things that you actually need into the rig and into the system before you know you get going, then you know you can get to the end result because the amount of times where you know that kind of logic, which is often a sort of an economics logic, you know, it's it's often like oh, it's cheaper to just outsource it perhaps uh, to a smaller team that can just do things very quickly, but then. The amount of times when you kind of go, actually, that's not just not working for us, you know. Um, <clears throat> but it's very, it's very dependent on the, on the, on the project, you know. Um, I suppose on that particular one, we also wanted to just do it in Houdini, you know, because uh, it's more fun. Yeah. Uh, so what was the final turnaround for one body track in the end, like? Well, well, that's the thing. It'd be it'd be the duration of the shot. Um, so we'd we'd be tweaking the body track and, and you know at the, the entire length of production the of entire the length shot, of basically. the shot like yeah. we'd get a first pass out very very quickly mm -hmm. that allows to choreograph everything and get all our you know dynamics kind of all the energies worked out and the velocities and things like that but um, you know inevitably as the dynamics come out you know you you've waited two days for that fluid sim or whatever it is um, that rigid body sim you kind of go actually. That's all a bit crazy because there's a little twitch there in the in the in the body track, and uh, you need to go back and fix it. Okay. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering about the kangaroo rig. Did you use a, the muscle system on that? And if so, did you use the like? The, I guess basic muscle system or the finite element muscle oh, system. Oh no! Well, with the kangaroos, uh, as soon as it's, um, I mean, we may still do because we're still uh, we're still working on that, um, and uh, that was that was mainly some uh, just some fem skin dynamics and uh, some fur, so the fur dynamics would cover a lot of it. So we weren't, using the, we weren't using the muscle system. Yeah, I was wondering. Uh, great talk, by the way. I was wondering how you dealt with uh, variations in the crowd in terms of with the spiders, if you had different uh, like uh, different models or how you dealt with texture variation and also with the lighting as well, if you had any challenges, especially when you have by the end of a shot, like everything is then, you know, into uh, the sort of ragdoll dynamics. What were the challenges there on the variations and the rendering? Oh, okay. Um, so with regards to the variation of the, of the crowd agents, um, that was fairly easy because um, essentially when you bake out an agent, um, Houdini has its own sort of rig definition that it stores in the agent database. So um, it's very easy to test your, your variations if you've got like different proportions on the limbs and things like that. Um, and, and then 
that flows into the ragdoll system quite easily. So if you've got one spider that's got a very small tail or you know, some spider that has sort of very long legs compared to very short legs, that propagates through into the, into the uh, collision uh, pills um, quite automatically. <coughs> I guess the challenge with, with the crowd system uh, for the spiders was really, well, you know, the system was only de designed for bipeds at the time, and it's a lot of legs. <laughs> so, you know, it, it would go crazy quite a lot at the beginning. Uh, and then also the velocity inheritance was, was quite a challenge. So to have, you know, the guys getting dragged along the ground and sort of get picked up by the spiders, you know, that spiders would um, go from a static terrain onto a, a deforming mesh. Uh, was was pretty pretty tricky, but again, because it's just a particle system in Houdini, um, it's quite easy. You just kind of do a pre-solve uh, step uh, where you sort of transfer the uh, the mesh velocity, and then a post-solve um, where you just sort of add that to the position. And, um, so it turned out to be quite straightforward. And I mean, I suppose that's the thing. It's a Houdini solver, so it's quite easy to build a solver within a solver and just you know daisy chain uh, different uh, operations per time step. Did you use any of the material cell sheets for doing variations? Oh yeah, time? yeah, we did actually. Although um, at the time, uh, at the time the the star sheets would would max out really. Uh, there was kind of because we were hitting like fifty thousand agents, and um, and you know obviously we wanted to have different textures and all the spiders and different shader attributes and things. And uh, so so I think yeah oh yeah that's right there is a there is one little hook in there. Um, still in the in the shader uh, things where you can uh, you know you can you can pull uh, packed attributes directly from the, yeah, the render from the state pop is that what you're talking about uh, yeah it's just like a, a vex thing for the for you know in the shaders where you can kind of go sort of like getting object level properties you can get packed primitive uh, properties as if it was an object so you can just have per point variation um, on spiders and just push that straight into the shader. So that turned out to be the fastest, um, which doesn't work with packed fragments, but uh, it worked for us. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else? Oh, no. <laughs> that guy again. <laughs> yeah, when he goes back. Um, were you rendering it all in Mantra, everything? Yep. Yeah, yeah, all rented in Mantra, yeah. It's kind of our, you know, because uh, you get so many licenses and um, and it's, uh, yeah, PBR is pretty solid. Uh, diffuse bounces are very quick. Um, the fur rendering is very, very fast. Um, so, yeah, all rented in Mantra. Uh, obviously, we've been, you know, especially of late, we've been uh, using Arnold for different projects, given that, given that a spin in, in Houdini. Um, you know, typically a lot of us come from a random man background. Um, so obviously that makes, and it's just nice that kind of mantra and, and random man sort of come from the same sort of history, same sort of progression. So from a shader perspective, uh, a lot of those, a lot of that logic kind of maps across. Um, but yeah, mantra is our, sort of our workhorse render. You just uh, inspired me. <laughs> uh, did you have to deal with the uh, fur and crowd agents at all? With the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so obviously the kangaroos uh, all have fur. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the spiders all had fur, although back then that was harder to render. Um, it's uh, basically because the subsurface uh, that we had in the spiders was using the old kind of uh, ray trace, uh, the older um, sub subsurface model that shipped with, say, the classic shader. And um, <clears throat> nowadays, the the subsurface uh, lobe, say that comes with the principal shader, is is uh, so much more faster and efficient. So it's much it's much faster to render that with fur uh, now. So uh, so it was it was harder to render the the spiders with fur than it was the kangaroos. Um, but of course, it's very easy in Houdini like to just do the fur simulation on on all the kangaroos. You just loop through them and uh, process it out. Stick it on the rent farm. Cool. 
Hey, um, any sort of uh, bits of uh, character rigging that you want to explore next after having done all this research? Um, yeah, well, so much. I guess, uh, you know, it is, it is uh, I think obviously the, the, you know, the one thing that I think we'd all like to see is just that round tripping from like hero asset, you know, hero kind of rig um, and motion capture into an agent and then back at the other end where you go, oh, that guy over there, we're just going to totally take him over and be a hero. So, um, so we were doing some of that with the, with the dog, actually. Um, but it, it didn't, for the amount of work that we'd have to do, especially on the rig prep side, to push all the hooks back into the hero rig. If we're doing lots of big, long, fast run uh, shots with the dog, like, so that, that was what we thought we might be doing, where we'd have lots of shots where the dog had to like run around and cover a lot of ground. So we thought, well, maybe, maybe this is where we need to do, um, go from the agent back into the hero rig. But, um, <coughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see more progress there. I'd like to see some of the things on um, on nested rigs versus flat rigs kind of being a bit more uh, resolved with, with side effects, just because obviously there's a lot of things involved there, and especially when it comes to agents, um, it would be great if the agent system could uh, take uh, you know a leg asset with an embedded rig in that and know how to deal with it. So currently, the uh, the agent uh, sort of IK definitions are all like uh, VEX headers, you know. So um, all the uh, all the solvers are sort of worked out in the uh, in the uh, agent uh, VEX libraries, and uh, and also the the rig the rig bones themselves are sort of embedded in the agent definition. So even just getting the you know you you'll push a rig in, but then the bones that you get back out from the agent aren't quite the same bones, you know, they sort of get reinitialized uh, for the agent definition. Um, so just, I think, and I think these things just naturally will work themselves out as more people use it, you know, and it gets more mileage. Anybody else? Cool.